turn. And so we've started the video. And so I think um, while we're still waiting for a few people to join us, we'll go ahead and convene the forum today. And for those of you who may not know, I'm Connie Nestor, and I've been chairing this history forum for nearly 12 years now. And I wanna wish you all a heartfelt welcome. And also, I want to wish all you dads out there, happy, happy Father's Day for next weekend. Um, as most of you know, yeah. I believe, uh, the Scottish American History Forum is part of the Arts and Cultural Division of Chicago Scots, formerly the Illinois St. Andrews Society, which founded the oldest 501c3 charity in the state of Illinois, in 1845, and it was later named Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care, located in North Riverside, Illinois. Chicago Scots is dedicated to nurturing Scottish identity through service, fellowship, and celebration of Scottish culture, in addition to support of Caledonia Senior Living and Memory Care. So for additional information, and uh, Dawn has just told us also about our alliance with the National Trust Scotland, but to learn all about us, uh, just go to www.chicagoscots.org. And we urge everyone to please give generously to our charity. Um, it's a mission that all Scots can be proud of. So before we begin our presentation today, I believe Gus Noble, OBE, has joined us. Uh, Gus is the president of Caledonia and Chicago Scots. And Gus is going to welcome everybody and update us on Caledonia and maybe tell us a little bit about the upcoming Scottish Festival and Highland Games here in Illinois, Gus, please. Is Gus on, Jack? I am not I'm, not quite here yet. So, Gus okay. is on mute. He's on mute. Okay, we'll give Gus a minute. There we go. So, sorry about that. I'm I'm driving and I uh, couldn't find the mute button. Sorry. Welcome, Gus. So Welcome. I'm unmuted now. And I apologize for any background noise. I'm driving from Saugatuck, uh, Michigan, where the family is been on vacation. Mm. You're breaking up quite a bit there, Gus. I doubt you can do much about it. Yeah, you're breaking up a lot, Gus. His poor man is probably yeah, hitting sorry, a bad I, cell. I, uh, Hey Gus, I've got an idea. Why don't we let Dawn, who's why, why don't... maybe Dawn can talk. Oh boy. Oh, you can say what you Great. said. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gus. Dawn, maybe oh. just a little about the games and the. Sure. So games are Friday and Saturday next weekend. They open at one o'clock on Friday and uh, Saturday at nine a.m. Um, it is our biggest event of the year. Uh, we usually have about 10,000 people come for our games. We are in a new location at the DuPage County Fairgrounds. I encourage anyone who's interested to get in touch with their Scottish identity to get to this event. We are going to have great weather and great fun. We are honoring um, uh, Gordon McAnally, who's president of Rotary International. He's only the second Scottish president of Rotary, Rotary International in its 119 year history. And uh, we are honoring Rotary as the honored clan and Gordon with the salute to the chieftain at the mast band uh, at the end of the day. 
So we'd love to have Rotarians are invited to join us and march with us. Uh, March with Gordon uh, to lead the Parade of Tartans. We have the National Chef of Scotland flying in. He is doing cooking demonstrations, complimentary, selling his cookbook as well. Uh, the largest pipe band competition in North America. Uh, hats off to Jim <laughs> Sim, president of the Midwest Pipe Band Association, for growing our competition here in the Midwest to being the largest in North America. We have three grade one bands coming. We have a lot of grade one soloists. It is going to be an extraordinary opportunity to hear from Pipers continuing a great thousand year old tradition. Um, it is a fun place to be. So I encourage everyone to come. Think about our, our reciprocal membership as well, because you can have those benefits no matter where you live. Uh, become a member of Chicago Scots if you're traveling to Scotland. It's a great value. And you are supporting our elder care mission. We are the only Scottish society in the world to own and operate an elder care community where we did not lose one resident to COVID during the entire pandemic nor to this day. So the care we give in a Scottish way has proven to be very steadfast and something that you can rely on. So thank you, Connie, over to you, back to you, please. Okay, very, very good. And I want everyone to know, if you move your cursor around towards the bottom of the screen, there's a participant list and you can see who's on. And also there's a chat box where you can type comments. But Karen has just sent us all a comment that She's uh, involved with the festival down in Florida. Uh, Karen, when is that festival? Can you just, I think you're unmuted. Oh, well, there are so many of them around here, but oh. we have a Scottish club that joined with the British club and we're called the Brits and Us. And we have a meeting once a month and we also have a huge uh, Robbie Burns dinner in January. And then we have other events that go on, but Mount Dora in the, uh, I think it's February, <coughs> near us has uh, Highland Games and also um, towards the coast. I'm, and I'm trying to think of that town right now, but there's a lot of uh, Scottish people here and they, they do have different events uh, throughout, mostly the winter time because there's so many <coughs> Northerners down here. Exactly, the snowbirds. Well, thank you for that. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to have opportunity for question and answer after Professor Burns' presentation this morning and can chat some more. And we're going to ask uh, Professor Burns to start in just a minute. But before we do, I just want to remind everybody about the topic for next month on July 13th, when we're going to have Dr. Graham Morton who is professor in modern history at the University Dundee in Scotland. And he is going to address a very current and relevant topic, climate change. And he's going to be comparing the future climate change in Scotland to that in North America. So since we're all enormously impacted by future climate change, I trust you'll not want to miss that opportunity. So now, on I mean, that, Connie, let me just <laughs> let me just note that that's that's the the Saturday of Grandfather Mountain Games this year. So yeah, maybe, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Although last year we had a number of participants from North Carolina. <laughs> really noted. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and turn the presentation over to Professor Bryant, to Professor Burns this morning. Um, Ryan, we're so pleased that you've joined us for the second time. Uh, Ryan is now assistant professor of history at Jacksonville State University in Jacksonville, Alabama. And he's joining us from Vancouver, where he's at an important academic conference this morning. But just want to remind everybody that Ryan is a graduate of Northwestern University right here in Chicago. So he, he's really one of our own and we're so proud of your early career, Ryan. You're just going gangbusters and we're thrilled that you made time for us today. 
So Ryan, take it away, please. Thank you so much, Connie, for that introduction and, and welcome to all of you. Very excited to be talking through the legacy of Glencoe this morning. So if you were, as many of us have been, uh, to find ourselves in Scotland and you travel up to Glencoe, you might encounter the Clatchig Inn, uh, which is um, a very nice place in Glencoe itself. Uh, there's a nice pub there. But if you go into the lobby, you'll see this particular plate as you check in, no hawkers or Campbells. Uh, and in some ways, it's one of the more uh, tongue-in-cheek ways that the Glencoe Massacre is remembered. You know, less uh, romantically are some of the great 19th century Highland advertisements, like this one for Mitchell Cigarettes, which has the image of Glencoe behind while they're trying to sell something in particular. But if we want to think through the importance and the legacy of Glencoe, it's important to take a wider step back. And this morning, what I'm going to do is walk us through some of the history of the McDonald's in general and the endemic conflicts of the Highlands in the 16th and 17th century, and then link that with the Jacobite rising in 1689 that was the proximate cause for the government's attempt to extirpate this race of murderous thieves, as Viscount Stair said so memorably in 1692. So, the McDonald's of Glencoe were one branch of what had been for centuries uh, the most powerful and important clan in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, if you look at this map of Clan Donald territories around 1400, you'll see that they comprise quite a vast span of space, you know, encompassing everything from Ross in the north uh, the Inner and Outer Hebrides, and then down into Northern Ireland. And uh, the Donalds, um, in possessing so much of this land, um, they are able to burnish their power. Uh, they connect their various uh, regions with what were called Berlins, uh, these uh, ships that would connect various islands in parts of the West Highland coast. Now, the McDonald's claimed descent from a Norse leader named Summerleg. Uh, you know, the Donalds themselves take their name from Donald McRonald, Summerled's grandson. And Summerled had been the Norse king of the isles in the... Uh, 12th century. He had gone to war with Scotland uh, in the middle of that century. Uh, and he's an ancestor of several island clans. You know, his other sons and grandsons included Alistair, Rory, and Dougal, and Mac being the Gaelic for son of. Uh, he's in many ways a kind of ancestral figure for much of this region of Scotland, uh, given the kind of politics and the outline of things of the day. The Donalds were able to burnish their power during the Wars of Independence when the clan chief Angus Og backs Robert the Bruce in his attempt to secure Scottish independence. And, and in fact, Angus Og gave sanctuary to Robert the Bruce when he was very much down on his luck in the first decade of the 1300s. And then at Bannockburn in 1314, uh, Angus Og very famously brought a contingent of McDonald's to fight. So it's in recognition and thanks for this service, especially at a time when Robert the Bruce was vulnerable, that Angus Og is granted vast tracts of land, which means that he's able to kind of burnish his credentials uh, in the Western Highlands more generally. And he's made what in English is referred to as Lord of the Isles. But in Gaelic, the term for Lord of the Isles uh, can be translated as King of the Isles to give you a sense 
of some of the ambitions of later clan chiefs in the century and a half after Angus Og's death. So um, across much of the 14th century, you have a situation where the Donalds are very powerful. And by the early 1400s, in fact, the Donalds make a bid for um, not only uh, greater territory and power in the highlands, but to actually expand into the lowlands itself. Uh, and uh, this is seen in an attempt to seize Aberdeen, which is checked at the Battle of Harlaw. Um, and uh, yet, despite this defeat, the Clan Donald is very keen to kind of continue their efforts. Uh, and not only seeing themselves as a kind of third ruler within the British Isles, um, one particular chief, John MacDonald, the Lord of the Isles in the late 14th and late 15th century, rather, made an alliance with Edward IV of England, uh, where um, the plan was to potentially uh, divide up Scotland between themselves. And, and so you would swallow up Scotland into a greater England and a greater kingdom of the Isles. An attempt that was defeated in 1480 at the Battle of Bloody Bay. So this is all some general background about the history of Clan Donald in the Middle Ages. But it's important to note that when this attempt by Clan Donald to end the Lordship of the Isles to kind of go to war with Scotland, when this is defeated, um, the Scottish government is very keen to reduce and um, make clear, reduce the power of Clan Donald and make clear that any attempts to seize power like this again would no longer be possible. Uh, and so in 1493, the title Lord of the Isles is actually taken from the Donalds uh, and is then just given to the Scottish crown. And territories belonging to the Donalds are largely broken up. And so it's actually from this period onward that you get the kind of period in Scottish history where there are endemic warring clans. There hadn't been as much of this in the Middle Ages as there was in the century or so after 1493, largely owing to the fact that Clan Donald had kept a lot of this in check. Once their power declines, then they're no longer able to do so. And so very much uh, you get a situation where um, with the kind of head of the snake being cut off, there's constant endemic clan on clan fighting in much of the highlands, which again, characterizes this particular century. The McDonald's are still there, uh, even if their power is reduced, uh, but from the 16th century onward, uh, the Campbells uh, in the Southwest take advantage of the power vacuum left by the defeat of the Lordship of the Isles to augment and expand their territory. Uh, and the Campbells, seeing that the Macdonalds had lost their power by fighting with the Scottish crown, they decide to do the very opposite. Uh, and see their power in the highlands as intimately connected to aligning with the crown, uh, really in whatever it seeks to accomplish, uh, being the crown's agents in the highlands uh, and using that as a power base to expand their territory. During the Scottish Reformation, uh, this is seen most visibly in the fact that uh, the Campbells align uh, with the newfound Presbyterian church. You know, there is some dispute about this among the clan leadership, but by the 17th century, uh, with people like Archibald Campbell, the eighth Earl of Argyll, uh, the Campbells would align themselves with the Presbyterian party in Scottish society. Uh, and uh, when the Covenanter period begins, the Campbells would very much serve as the kind of Highland wing or Highland arm of the Covenanter movement. So 
The Campbells, in seeking to take advantage of this power vacuum, uh, reduce the power of the McDonald's and all these other clans that have very much been on the decline since 1493, uh, they are, you know, engaging in cattle reaving. They're kind of slowly encroaching on other clans' lands. Uh, and they're also characterizing this as an attempt to reform the Highlands, to bring the Protestant faith uh, to these other clans. And if they won't cooperate, then to be rid of them. This is at least what the Campbells say. Uh, but I should note that, you know, religious history in the Highlands is an incredibly murky area because a lot of the churches that are established in parts of the Highlands were very bad at keeping records. Uh, a sharp contrast to uh, Protestant churches in the Lowlands, which are in fact very good uh, at keeping them. Uh, in fact, uh, you can uh, go to the Scotland's People website and read digitized versions of Kirk Session minutes, the minutes of parish church courts for much of 16th and 17th century Scotland, uh, which can give you a flavor of just how much is available. But in the Highlands, there's very little. Uh, and so uh, what we have are basically the Campbell's word that many of these other clans are uh, effectively remaining Catholic. They're not on board with the Reformation. And therefore, the Campbell's can, can bring it to them by force. Um, now, to give you a little bit of a sense of how they might be a bit misleading in this attempt, to characterize the Highlands in this way, and also not to let the McDonald's off the hook for some of their history, given uh, the legacy of Glencoe a bit later. Uh, we do know at least that many McLeods had converted to Protestantism, in part because despite there being uh, very little in the way of actual church records, we do know that on a particular Sunday in 1578, the McLeods were all dutifully at Trump and Church in Sky when the McDonald's suddenly attacked and um, burned the church and slaughtered much of the Klan. And again, if there wasn't much religiosity in the Highlands or Protestantism wasn't making much of an inroad, well, no one would have been at this particular Protestant church here in 1578, and yet the Klan was, and much of the Klan was killed. So you've got religious divisions, or at least the appearance of them as justified by the Campbells. Uh, but as the 17th century wore on, uh, the Campbells would back the Covenanter cause, uh, the Covenanters uh, being Scottish Presbyterians who imagined a national covenant between themselves, the king, uh, and God, uh, and fought against both English attempts to impose um, an Episcopal settlement on Scotland, as well as any remnants of what they saw as popery across either the Lowlands or the Highlands. The Campbell's rivals in this particular region, like the McDonald's and others, because the Campbell's have adopted this cause, many of them range against it. Uh, and so the McDonald's would follow the Marquess of Montrose when he fought against the Covenanters in the 1640s. And when the Covenanting cause is defeated finally uh, with both Oliver Cromwell's invasion of Scotland in 1651, and then the restoration of Charles II in 1660, uh, the Campbells are on the outs and clans like the McDonald's are able to engage in a period of recovery, aligning themselves with the Episcopalian rulers of Scotland, this being King Charles II uh, and his government there. So for the next several decades, uh, Campbell power wanes, the power of the McDonald's improves, but everything comes to a crashing halt uh, as far as the McDonald's are concerned uh, with the glorious revolution of 1688. 
uh, which saw the government of James the Seventh of Scotland and Second of England uh, overthrown by William of Orange and his wife Mary. Uh, and, and just to give a little bit of background of this glorious revolution, you know, it's occurring because James the Seventh and Second, who had come to the throne in 1685, is himself a Catholic. You know, he is the younger brother of that Charles II who had been restored in 1660. Uh, but while Charles sought to impose an Episcopalian settlement across all of his kingdoms, uh, James converts to Catholicism sometime in the late 1660s, uh, largely owing to the influence of his wife, his first wife rather, Anne Hyde. Uh, who introduced him to her confessor, and James seemed to like what he heard, and so he agrees to convert. His conversion happens after uh, his and Anne Hyde's two daughters have um, basically kind of grown to the state where they've been educated as Protestants, and the two daughters that he had would, of course, remain Protestant. Um, but James announces his Catholicism to the world, uh, despite Charles II finding out about this and being very upset, in 1673, when the English Parliament passed a law requiring any public office holder to pass a religious test uh, meaning that you had to swear allegiance to the Church of England, uh, you had to communicate, uh, so you had to take communion uh, at least once a year. And this is a requirement for public office. Uh, James resigns his position as Secretary of the Navy uh, rather than take this test, which throws uh, both England and Scotland uh, into a kind of slow burning crisis because Charles II, despite having many illegitimate children, has no legitimate children with his wife, Catherine of Braganza, meaning that James is the heir to the throne and he's announced that he is Catholic. Uh, this is setting itself up to be a problem. There was an attempt in the 1670s at late 1670s, rather, to exclude James from the throne. You know, the uh, Whigs in Parliament put forward several exclusion bills that would prevent a Catholic from taking the throne. Uh, these bills fail. Um, you know, they don't succeed in the Lords. Um, the second one does actually pass the Commons, but it too is unsuccessful in the Lords. And the reason why exclusion doesn't actually succeed is more to the point that while James's Catholicism is deplored in Protestant England and in Protestant Scotland, uh, the fact that James has no sons and his two daughters are Protestant means that uh, his eldest daughter, Mary, a Protestant, will succeed him as the monarch and James would just be a Catholic interlude. Uh, so there's not gonna be a permanent Catholic dynasty. This belief persists even after Anne Hyde dies and James remarries. He marries a woman named Mary of Medina, an Italian Catholic, but she is unable to have a successful pregnancy uh, for more than a decade. Uh, so, it's assumed that she must be barren too, that James, who is into in his 50s, is not going to have any sons. And so therefore, you can expect that a Protestant daughter, Mary, will succeed him and this whole crisis will go away. In 1685, James succeeds his brother, Charles. Uh, he promises not to alter um, the state of affairs in either England and Scotland to respect the churches as by law established. Uh, and um, 
without going into a tremendous level of detail about uh, all the in and outs of James's reign, I should note that the delicate balancing act of believing that he was just a Catholic interlude comes to a crashing halt when Mary of Medina gives birth to a son in June 1688. And this son she gives birth to is, of course, James Francis Edward Stewart, uh, who would become the old pretender in Jacobite iconography. So the birth of a son causes a number of important problems uh, for James uh, and raises the stakes of his reign. Because James Francis Edward Stewart, by virtue of being male, automatically is placed ahead of James's by now uh, adult daughter Mary. And this raises the specter of a Catholic dynasty being permanent in Britain. Now, some of James's advisors were a bit worried about the Protestant reaction to this, both in Scotland and in England. They urged him to maybe uh, think critically about whether he would in fact bring um, his son up as a Catholic. Maybe don't do that. Maybe bring him up as a Protestant. Maybe announce that you're going to bring him up as a Protestant uh, and maybe figure it out later. Thus, you know, delaying the comeuppance for another day. Or at the very least, perhaps just say nothing uh, and try to ignore this issue. Don't burnish the fact that you're intending to bring him up as a Catholic. Uh, James listens to all this advice and responds by naming the Pope, Pope Innocent XI, as the boy's godfather, which is all the news and that one would need to signal James's intentions. So naturally enough, the fact that you now have uh, a male heir who is going to uh, be raised as a Catholic is deeply anathema to much of the Protestant population, but also especially James's Protestant daughter, Mary, who is herself married to the stadtholder leader of the Netherlands, William of Orange, who very much wanted his wife to succeed as Queen of England. And as leader of the Netherlands is very keen on um, moving England away from an alliance with Catholic France and um, toward a better relationship with the Netherlands of which he of course is leader. So William and Mary do not like the fact that there's now a male heir and they encourage without saying that they ever believe it, this legend that uh, in fact, Mary of Medina had never been pregnant at all, that a baby boy had been smuggled into the palace in a warming pan, you know, some random orphan off the street who's taken and then given to the queen so as to be able to pretend like she had given birth to a son and thus perpetuate popery in Britain. Now, there is absolutely no evidence that this is true, that Mary of Medina actually did this. You know, the proponents of the warning pen myth said that she kept a pillow uh, in her petticoat for nine months to, and kind of steadily added, added feathers to it. Um, also, uh, she was rumored to potentially have had uh, either an affair uh, or uh, used as agent her Jesuit confessor, Father Peters. Uh, again, there's absolutely no evidence of this at all, but William and Mary encourage people asking questions about this, which is serving to kind of undermine uh, the very basic idea uh, that this is actually a kind of legitimate error uh, thus kind of subtly undermining 
the very claim. So to make a very long uh, and complicated story short, William of Orange decides to um, invade England to further investigate this particular issue. He and a fleet of more than 10,000 troops land on the anniversary of the gunpowder plot in Torbay uh, on the southern coast of England, uh, November 5th, 1688. Uh, James's forces basically melt away. Uh, he flees to France by the end of the year, and an English parliament declares James's crown to be effectively vacant. Now, this is the Glorious Revolution, which of course is glorious because it's bloodless in England, but it's very not, very much not bloodless elsewhere in the Stuart realms, both in Ireland, where its legacy of course continues to this day in um, sometimes very contentious ways, especially in the North, and in Scotland, uh, which, uh, in the narrative I've given you of the Glorious Revolution, kind of isn't really at the center of events, but would very much become so in the wake of James's escape. So in Scotland, um, so in Scotland, uh, James's reign is still technically valid in 1689. Uh, but a convention is called to decide whether or not James ought to remain as King of Scotland. Uh, and this convention is held uh, and both William of Orange and James are invited to give addresses. Uh, and here you can actually see uh, William's address, which is fairly conciliatory, you know, he says to them, now it lies on you to enter upon such consultations as are most probable to settle you on sure and lasting foundations, which we hope you will set about with all convenient speed with regard to the public good and to the general interest and inclinations of the people that after so much trouble and great suffering, they may live happily and in peace and that you may lay aside all animosities and factions that may impede so good a work. So we bid you heartily farewell. A fairly conciliatory address, you know, you do what you want. I'm not demanding that you make me king and deprive James of his crown. Now this is James's address, less conciliatory, as you can see. He says to them, we let you know that we will pardon all such as shall return to their duty before the last day of this month inclusive, and that we will punish with the rigor of our laws all such as shall stand in rebellion against us or our authority. So not doubting that you will declare for us and suppress whatever may oppose our interest, and that you will send some of your number to us with an account of your diligence and the posture of our affairs we bid you heartily farewell. So the convention by a majority vote um, gives the crown to William after uh, some debate. But there were partisans of James in Scotland and this largely had to do with the fact that again, the Stuarts have been the dynasty that's ruled first Scotland and then England for some centuries. Uh, William of Orange becoming king uh, is certain to improve the lot of the Presbyterian party in Scotland against Episcopalians. So some Scottish Episcopalians are uh, in favor of keeping James on the throne, despite, of course, James not being Episcopalian, but being Catholic. Uh, so there's divisions in Scottish society about this. And there are some who believe that it's wrong to remove uh, the rightful king from the throne. You know, believers in divine right monarchy where James is, has been given his crown by God and therefore to disrupt this makes you an enemy of God. Um, so there's divisions that emerge 
And then, you know, divisions that follow where your traditional enemies back one side, so you back the other. Uh, beginning in 1689, a major Jacobite coming from the Latin for James, Jacobus, uh, emerges in Scotland, a major Jacobite rising, led by a man named John Graham of Claverhouse, uh, Viscount Dundee. Now, Dundee had some reasons for raising a force of men to defend James's claim to the crown of Scotland. Mainly, it's that Dundee had, in the early 1680s, been an inveterate enemy of the Presbyterian party in Scotland uh, and was nicknamed by them Bloody Claverhouse for having suppressed illegal Presbyterian gatherings called conventicles. Uh, and so he's very much not going to be someone who's going to have much power or respect in this new regime and fights to defend the old one. So he raises a rebellion, which quickly takes on a romantic glow that remains with us all the way to this day. You know, there are, in fact, Highland romances, uh, fairly steamy, that take Bonnie Dundee as the titular hero. Bonnie Dundee is kind of has nice ring to it as well. So a lot of this kind of factors in the background. But Dundee raises an army, uh, and it's comprised mostly of Highland Jacobites who are afraid the Campbells will take advantage of their kind of Presbyterian alignment with William to exact revenge for being really out of influence for the past couple decades. So you've got McDonald's and, and so on who back the Jacobite cause. Uh, and at the Battle of Killiecrankie in the Central Highlands, the Jacobites score a great victory over government forces. But this battle would prove to be fairly bittersweet because Bonnie Dundee dies. And when he dies, the sails of this rebellion are basically snuffed out because there was division in the kind of leadership of the rising as to who his replacement ought to be. You know, Bonnie Dundee's charisma hold various, you know, factions that don't really get along with each other together. And at his death, there was a fight over, again, who is going to succeed him. One commander, Ewan Cameron of Lochiel, uh, expected to be Dundee's replacement. Uh, and Cameron of Lochiel had made a career in a uh, kind of Highland fighter. Uh, he was kind of renowned for his ability to kind of pounce on an enemy. Uh, he was said to have removed the throat of one of his opponents during a fight. So it's not really someone to, to mess with, but uh, Ewan Cameron is not given command. Instead, command of the rising passes to a man named Alexander Cannon, who years before had actually fought alongside William of Orange as a mercenary. And so it was thought that he would have a better sense of William's agenda and priorities. But Ewan Cameron of Lochiel is so upset about this that he actually just simply leaves the army, resigns his commission, takes many of his clansmen with him, and with this reduced force, less than a month later, the Jacobite rising in Scotland gets snuffed out at the Battle of Dunkeld in August 1689. Uh, so as a result of this, uh, you face a situation where the Jacobites have um, been defeated in the field. The government isn't really able to occupy much of the Highlands, though. Uh, and James Dalrymple, Viscount Stair, uh, is very keen to pacify the Highlands of these rebellious clans, but wants to do it on the cheap because the government is fighting a war in Ireland. It's 
also fighting the French on the continent, the French having uh, aligned with James, uh, starting what was called the Nine Years' War. So there aren't many troops to spare, and the Highlands is unoccupied. And so Dalrymple chooses a kind of carrot and stick policy uh, with a kind of big stick behind and decides that he would require those clans that had been in rebellion to swear an oath of allegiance to William and Mary. Uh, and each clan chief is given until January 1st, 1692 to accomplish this. So time goes by. Uh, these clan chiefs basically kind of dither uh, and they wait for instructions from uh, the exiled James II to, saying, you know, if you can't invade Scotland with an army, then can you give us permission to take this oath? We don't really mean the like words of the oath, but we need to do it so as not to be wiped out. Eventually, James gives his permission, but this causes all sorts of delays for many of these clan chiefs, not just the McDonald's, uh, whose uh, clan chief in the early 1690s, the, the chief of the McDonald's of Co, was a man named Alistair McIan. In December of 1691, late December, uh, McGeehan decides that he really needs to take the oath, uh, and he travels to Fort William through a bitter snowstorm, where he encounters a man named Colonel Hill. And he asks Colonel Hill if he would take the oath for him uh, and register that the oath had been given. Technically speaking, According to the text of the order from Viscount Stair, a magistrate had to be the one who took the oath, not an army officer. So Colonel Hill was not in a position to actually legally receive McKeon's oath. And instead, Colonel Hill tells him that uh, to give his oath, He's going to have to travel south to Inverary, the kind of capital of the Campbells, and needs to do this immediately. And a magistrate there could then administer the oath. McGeehan really doesn't want to do this. It's um, the winter, there's a driving snowstorm, and yet he's required to travel more than 60 miles in this terrible weather, uh, but he does. Uh, he does travel down there and he gets there just in time to take the oath on January 6th. Only notice that this is after January 1st. Uh, the oath is administered, but all the same, uh, it was after the January 1st deadline. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, McGeehan thinks that you know, surely the snowstorm ought to be a mitigating factor. No revenge will be taken against me for missing the deadline. Uh, and he travels back to Glencoe to reunite with his clan. Not long after, uh, the government, which is not exactly um, in a position to forgive what it sees as McGeehan's recalcitrance, dispatches two companies of troops under the command of Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon. And Campbell of Glen Lyon travels to Glencoe and has an excuse to basically um, give to McGeehan where and he is obliged to provide a kind of Highland hospitality to him. Uh, McGeehan agrees, and Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon uh, and his troops, about 120 of them, um, mostly comprised of men of Clan Campbell, are given sanctuary 
so for two weeks, they're given shelter. Uh, they listen to bards in the evenings. Uh, they drink wine and whiskey and have what seems to outward appearances a grand old time. And yet Campbell of Glen Lyon is under orders to basically bide his time. And on the 12th of February, 1692, he gets this particular order uh, from an army commander named Major Duncanson. So as you can see from this particular text, uh, Glen Lyon is hereby ordered to fall upon the rebels, the McDonald's of Glencoe, you know, for their temerity of missing that January 1st deadline. And the government wants to make an example of these clansmen and put all to the sword under 70. You are to have a special care that the old fox and his sons do upon no account escape from your hands. You are to secure all the avenues that no man escape. This you are to put in execution at five of the clock precisely, meaning five o'clock in the morning the following day. And that by that time or very shortly after it, Major Duncanson promises that I'll strive to be at you with a stronger party. If I do not come to you at five, you are not to tarry for me, but to fall on. This is by the king's special command for the good and safety of the country that these miscreants be cut off root and branch. See that this be put in execution without feud or favor, else you may expect to be dealt with as one not true to king nor government, nor a man fit to carry commission in the king's service. So the order to exterminate the McDonald's is given. Clearly, Duncanson thinks that there might be some reticence on Campbell of Glen Lyon's part. You know, he had been with these people for two weeks. Maybe he's reluctant to follow through. So it's a massacre them or else. You will be not true to king nor government if you fail to follow through. <clears throat> so at 5 a.m. the next morning, Campbell of Glen Lyon and his soldiers fall upon the McDonald's. Uh, McGeehan is murdered in his own home. And all in all, about 38 men and women and children are killed by the Campbells in what would come to be known as the Glencoe Massacre. Now, Campbell of Glen Lyon did not fully follow his orders, though, there, because there were about 500 McDonald's, and yet only 38 of them are known to have been killed. There's a few dozen more that die of exposure in the weeks that follow, but only 38 are directly killed. And this partially reflects the fact that some soldiers must have been uncomfortable with this and gave warnings. Uh, two of McKeon's sons actually get suspicious that the you know Campbells are kind of lurking about. They're taking detailed notes about the entrances of various buildings and uh, where to kind of post people. So they actually get so suspicious that they can kind of leave um, their house and they kind of explore on that very night, the 12th and 13th of February. And therefore they're in fact not killed uh, though uh, they're not able to kind of intervene to save anyone. So all in all, there seems to have been some warning given. And there are some stories about particular people that uh, received warnings. You know, uh, Campbell is said to have actually taken a family on a walk and pointed at a stone and said, you know, this stone has seen much quarrel and turmoil 
in its history is a stone, but it will never match the turmoil and sadness that it will witness tonight. You know, a clear message to the family he was with to get out as soon as they possibly could. But despite that, you know, even if not as many McDonald's had been killed as the government would have wished, um, at least 38 were. And the massacre under the guise of hospitality was shocking. Uh, you know, it's a violation of the Highland tradition of giving hospitality to a stranger, any stranger, you know, even if you're at variance with them. And so that it was done under the banner of hospitality made this whole situation even worse. Uh, by Count Stair, who had come up with this policy to begin with, um, was unrepentant about his part in the drama, insisted that in fact, uh, he had nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, Duncanson too, uh, was very much not someone that really regretted what happened. Although it was said that Campbell of Glen Lyon would stay awake at night and see the ghosts of his victims. And, and uh, he would often be found you know, in taverns, looking into his ale tankard and weeping. Uh, not exactly a great look for a soldier of his bent, but clearly someone who is said to at least have felt remorse for his part in this drama. So that's the massacre of Glencoe, which of course uh, retains uh, its legacy as one of the most important Highland dramas of the Jacobite period. You know, it's uh, somewhat ironic that one of the names that is often given for Glencoe, one of the translations, uh, although it's fairly murky as far as how accurate this is, uh, is that Glencoe means veil of tears. Uh, and regardless of whether that's true, there were many tears to be shed on that night, early morning uh, of the 12th and 13th of February in that year of 1692. So I'm happy to, to open it up for questions. Well, bravo, bravo, Professor. That was fascinating. And I learned a whole number of things I didn't know. Questions, comments for Professor Burns for his excellent presentation. Don't be shy. Jack, maybe you can unmute everyone so that they can speak up. Catherine? Th thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was really great. Um, I, I learned, I, I knew about it kind of vaguely, but but this it was really great to, to learn the details and all, all of what led up to it. And um, I'm not sure I really even knew all that much about how the Jacobite Rebellion started. So thank you for that too. Of course. What was the aftermath? So um, there, there were some recriminations in Scotland. So the letter that um, Duncanson sends uh, is published. And, and uh, this causes uh, quite a bit of an uproar, uh, even in places like Edinburgh and Glasgow and the kind of lowland central belt, um, because it seemed to be, a, you know, a, was a premeditated attack. Uh, and so there were calls to actually impeach Stair and to take away the commissions of those involved in this massacre. Um, but this doesn't really move beyond calls to help to hold people to account. Uh, so, you know, Stair doesn't lose his position as Secretary of State for Scotland, even though there are demands that he do so. 
uh, William of Orange is a bit upset that this was done so ineptly. Uh, so, uh, you know, from, from his perspective, uh, and he tells this to some of his confidants, it's okay that you wanted to extirpate the McDonald's given that they have thrown in their lot with my enemies but did it need to be done under the badge of hospitality? Like that was a particularly bad way of doing it that uh, opened the government up to needless criticism. Uh, so, so there, there are some, there are attempts to at recriminations, uh, but things don't move much beyond words. What other clans did they attempt to extirpate? extirpate? Uh, so, None. Uh, the McDonald's are singled out. Uh, there, there were plans to go after uh, Glengarry, uh, and uh, you know the this particular clan had not um, signed its oath of allegiance at all. Uh, but any attempt to to kind of pursue anyone else. Uh, would have come to a screeching halt after this massacre anyway, given the, the kind of uproar against it. Uh, but it's really the McDonald's of Glencoe that are singled out. Uh, so it's thought, be rid of them, and they'll serve as the example to get everyone else in line. What, what was the effect on public opinion of the other clans in the Highlands? So what this does do is, you know, no greater advertisement for the Jacobite cause. Uh, so, you know, William is identified with this massacre of men, women, and children under the guise of hospitality. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, you know, this makes clear that, you know, there are kind of, consequences to be had by getting too close to the government, that they're not going to respect any aspect of Highland culture, uh, that they're willing to enact a massacre like this. Uh, and so uh, many other clans, even those who didn't really want much to do with the McDonald's, uh, are um, keen to, to kind of act on this by kind of demanding revenge. And so it makes for Jacobinism being very popular in the Highlands, you know, for the next half century and more. How did it affect the power of the Clan Campbell? Uh, so uh, Clan Campbell continues to increase its power in the wake of this. Uh, you know, successive um, earls and then of Argyll uh, are... Uh, given senior positions in the Scottish and then the British military. Uh, you know, in 1715, during that Jacobite rising, the government troops were actually commanded by Argyle, uh, who's um, successful uh, in defeating this particular Jacobite rising. Uh, so the, the, the Campbells uh, are in a good position after this, and they continue to increase their, their power uh, in the Western Highlands. You're what is the position of the Campbells today as a result of this? What's that? What is the position of the Campbells today as a result of all of this? Are they still large landowners because of the advantages that they gained here? Or did they pretty much leave Scotland at some point? Um, so, I mean, the Campbells remain very influential uh, in the Western Highlands. Uh, so um, they... Uh, are you know, their their position improves? Um, you know, there's a there's a Campbell diaspora um, as much as there are for other clans too. You know, the clearances affect Campbell lands as well. Uh, but the uh, the Campbells today uh, do control quite a bit of, of land. You know, having aligned with the government, they remain aligned with them throughout the 18th century. So, you know, the Campbells, although there are some outliers, you know, some Campbells that break ranks, uh, the clan institutionally 
backs the government against the Jacobite risings that occur, both 1715, uh, again in 1719, and then in 1745. Uh, so uh, the Campbells don't face the kind of retribution recriminations that uh, occur elsewhere in the Highlands. What was the impact to the migration to Northern Ireland, if any, caused by all of this? Um, so there was a, you know, a, a steady stream uh, of, of Scots that would go to Northern Ireland across the 17th century. Um, it's important to note that as mostly Presbyterians, uh, when the Campbells go to, to Northern Ireland, they more or less integrate with the other lowland Protestants who go settle there. Uh, so there, there are some Campbells that, that do this. Um, there aren't necessarily very many, uh, but there are some that do that. Uh, any other questions? Can you segue, it's about, it's almost a hundred years later, but can you segue this all, and, and show us how it connects to Culloden? Um, sure. So, um, so at Culloden, uh, the, you, and this was, this was kind of typical of um, a lot of, you know, in clan battles where you would recite the names of your ancestors before you would give a charge. Uh, at Culloden, uh, the um, not just the McDonalds, but but several other uh, clans um, recited um, a kind of brief couple lines about this being vengeance for the massacre at Glencoe. That never again, under hospitality, will we uh, open our arms to this government. Uh, so it's kind of remembered there. But again, the, the fact that Highland clans are so keen on backing the Jacobite cause when Bonnie Prince Charlie shows up in 1745 uh, speaks to speaks to in some ways a kind of reflexive uh, stance that occurs after this. Because the Jacobite rising in 1689 didn't really go super well. Uh, and the Jacobite cause might have vanished uh, in the years after... 1691, had the government done a better job at actually um, you know, pacifying the highlands and making sure not to make needless enemies, the fact that it does so, so kind of bluntly here uh, gave people an excuse to continue to oppose them. Uh, so when Bonnie and Prince Charlie arrives, you know, the legacy of Glencoe is on some people's minds uh, as they enlist in his armies. Well, the, this was jam, you had a jam packed presentation, Professor Burns, and I am going to watch the video in the very near future. Um, the, I found it very enriching, all of this information. Wonderful. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Well, I'm feel free to, so to reach out, uh, any of you, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Would you like to give everyone your email address? Yes. Uh, so my my email address is uh, rcburns uh, at jsu.edu. Thank Very you. Scottish name. I can't think why everyone's so quiet this morning. Maybe you're just mesmerized. But are, are, is there any additional discussion? Our questions for Dr. Burns. I think that has to do with how thorough his, his presentation was. <laughs> yeah, just thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, Caroline. Caroline's one of our governors here 
uh, at Chicago's Gods. Nice to see you, Caroline. I'm wearing my Clan Campbell tartan. <laughs> as a as a Burns, we were seps of the Campbells. Uh, so this is <laughs> an interesting take for me too. And of course, I have to ask: Are you are you a descendant of Robert? Uh, so uh, according to family lore, yes. According to any amount of records, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, he had quite a few that that didn't have very yes. many records. Right? <laughs> this is true. This is true. I think he had. Didn't he have thirteen children or something like that? Quite, quite a few. Well, and you know, I don't know. Ron Coots got off the call. He was the former high commissioner of the McDonald clan, but he's no longer on. I'd love to hear. Oh, 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 oh. Where was I? <laughs> yeah, you didn't click in when you should have. I told you, that's why I was telling oh. you. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can get in. You're in. You're in, Ron. We can hear you and see you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I first I want to compliment Professor Burns on uh, a great presentation. Uh, again, we've heard many many stories about uh, uh, Glencoe and and how the massacre took place in the whole nine yards. And I mean, we got we look around as McDonald's. You think we got so many enemies, but we're we friends of of everyone. Believe it or not, um, the Del Rimples, I understand they came in as well as uh, when they did the battle, uh, when they did the massacre, they were a part of that group that went in to the massacre, right? Yes. Uh, I, matter of fact, the reason I understand that is I had a friend that was Adele Rempel and he told me the whole story. So we got really close about this uh, Grenko situation. But again, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. I thought it was uh, excellent. And you covered a lot of places, a lot of things that I understood and heard way back when. So. Again, uh, excellent. Thank you very much. It was well worth attending. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate that. OK, well, if there's not any additional discussion, I, we're just about to have a festival planning meeting on site at the fairgrounds in about an hour, so some of us need to jump in the car and hit the road uh, here in Illinois. But uh, I want to thank all of, we have such a tremendous turnout. We, we have a global group. We have people from different states in America and Canada every month. And, and this particular session has been very value added. I have some emails here where people couldn't make it today for various reasons, but they plan to watch the video, uh, Dr. Burns. So. This this will be a very popular one. Uh, Ryan, I can't thank you enough for being here today. And uh, we're so glad Ryan's going, he's just agreed to speak at the annual North America dinner on October 19th down in Atlanta for the North Americans that are that are part of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. So anybody who wants to come down to Atlanta on October 19, uh, reach out and, and we can talk to you about that as well. But so thank you, uh, Dr. Burns. And I'll wish everyone else a good day and hope to see you all on J July 13. So thank you. Be safe. Wonderful. Good luck thank with you your so games. Much. Thank you. Good luck with your games, Connie. <laughs> yes, we'll have a history tent there. <laughs> Great.